Would you stand as we sing to the Lord this morning?
You guys can grab a seat. Hello to everyone. Good to see you guys. Um, first, quick thing, if you see on your table, there's some little invitations for the family game night. We're doing our second family game night here at Taco Jed this Wednesday. Everyone is invited. Um, you can stop in anytime between 5 and 7 p.m. We will have bingo games for the kids and kids at heart. Um, we'll have some activities for the kids, free chips and salsa and queso. Definitely get the queso. And it's just going to be a lot of fun to spend some time together. And this is also an opportunity just to invite um, anyone that you may know that is looking for a faith community, so anyone that's asking questions about God and wanting to get connected somewhere. There's no program or anything on this night. It's just a fun evening together and it's a fun way to meet new people um, in our community. And Steve is spreading the word about it to the Taco Jed world. So hopefully we'll all have the opportunity to meet some new people. Um, so this Wednesday, 5 to 7 p.m., we hope to see you then. Um, and then the other thing, I wanted to just give you guys a little bit of an update um, related to our middle school and high school group and kind of what's been going on there for the past couple months for those of you that don't get to be a part of that group on a regular basis. But each Monday evening, we have about 12 to 15-ish, it varies, but 12 to 15-ish middle schoolers and high schoolers that get together at Colin and Andrea Thomas's home, as well as three amazing leaders. Mickey is one of them, and then Colin and Abby. Um, and it's just a really fun time together. And um, one of my favorite things about this group is that most of the evenings when we start, we just start sitting in a circle talking together. And there's been so many times where I've just like looked around the circle at the group of students that are sitting there and thought like, I don't know how God brought these people together, but God has done it and it's really, really beautiful. We have kids from like a super wide variety of family situations, a wide variety of life experience, like tons of different cultural backgrounds, um, widely different beliefs about who God even is. And yet they come together and because we're all seeking Jesus and asking questions about who God is, this really unique, um, special thing is happening there. And it's just fun to get to be a witness to it. Um, it's also because we're very different. It's chaos. Um, it's messy and complicated and there's nothing glamorous about it, but I can't just help but think when I see them that this is the kingdom of God. Like the only explanation we can give as to why this group of 15 of us is sitting in a room together is that God did this. Um, and the students recognize that and they talk about it and it's just a cool thing to see. So right now we are going through the book of Mark um, just kind of section by section. And it's super fun because our students are taking turns leading the, they're preparing the conversations and then leading the conversations. And so they get as leaders, we just get to sit back and watch them be the people God made them to be. Um, and the questions they're asking about God and the questions that the ideas they're, they're bringing up. If I think back on my own relationship with God over the last couple of months, probably their questions have been some of the most formative parts of my relationship with God. Um, so it's cool just that we can grow together and we don't have any answers to most of the questions, but we can bring those questions together and experience more of who God is through that. Um, so would invite you just to be praying for our students. Um, at the end of every night, we take some time and we split up into small groups and we ask the same questions in our small groups every week. Um, and one of those questions is, what is worrying you at the moment? Um, and I'm often struck by the weight of the burdens that our students are carrying, whether it's school stuff, whether it's stuff going on at home. Um, they have a lot on their shoulders. And so just praying that those, we would all be people who bring our burdens to Jesus first, um, knowing that he is with us, not that those burdens are going to magically go away, but that he can walk with us in the midst of it. So invite you to be praying for our students in that way there. 
very awesome people. So thank you guys for being a part of that. So this morning, whether you are, whether you feel like you're in a period of rest or whether you're in a period of needing some revival, rebuilding, restoring, um, God wants his people to communicate with him. So one thing that we're looking at this morning is the prayer of Nehemiah. Um, and we see that we have a God who understands and wants us to come to him with our prayers, um, our petitions, with thanksgiving. Uh, so we're going to look at what are the things that God wants us to pray? What are the things that he's looking for? Um, and before we look at that, um, our call to worship this morning is from Hebrews 4, and it talks about um, what we have in Jesus. So here's Hebrews 4 from uh, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need.
And Lord Jesus, that's part of our prayer this morning, that we would not be the same. We came in with different things in our hearts and in our minds, the burdens that we carry, but we have come this morning to honor you, to glorify you, to draw close to you, to have your spirit that lives within us rise up and give us your eyes and ears and fill us with the hope that knows no bounds. So we are here this morning um, for you, and uh, Lord, we come with our hearts desiring that. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. That's, I appreciate that, and thank you, Melinda, for sharing with us what God's been in the midst of doing, and He is. And, and I love that song, Nobody Leaves the Same. Um, last week, we, we actually had this introduction of the person who lived long ago, but he left a profound impact on, on the people around him. And uh, that was that whole person of Nehemiah, which we're into right now. We're, we're going to look at his life and his prayer and his passions and say, what, is, what does God teach us in, in the midst of that? So as you come this morning, whatever it is that's maybe distracting you or whatever it is that you're going to, I'm just going to ask you to just say, Lord, just may you come and give me insights that I might not have on my own. Um, he said, if you ask for wisdom, he will give it. And so we come asking him for that this morning. So when you look at the, the, the person of Nehemiah, one of the things that gets, catches me is this is 500 years before the time of Christ. And the people had lived in Israel for centuries before. And God had told them, come and obey me and you'll live in the land for a long time. Disobey me and you'll be carried off into captivity. And guess what? That's what happened. The people stopped listening. We've come together today because we want to listen. We want to hear from God. We, we, we totally want to say, Lord, we want to be your people wherever you call us to be. So what happened is, and during this time, the Babylonians then came and conquered God's people and took the leading citizens about a thousand miles away um, to Susa. And as this discipline time was starting to end, several years before Nehemiah's day, some of God's people were given permission to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the broken down temple and the broken down city that was there. And Ezra was the person who was in charge of that, in charge of doing that rebuilding of the temple. But the attempts to actually build um, and rebuild, actually, this protective wall around this city, which was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC had been frustrated. Some of those enemies of Judah continued to knock those down. They did not want people to feel secure. And as a result, very few people wanted to live in the capital. They felt that that was not a good place. Jerusalem was still a city of ruins because they did not feel safe there. They wanted to feel secure and they didn't. So Nehemiah, he lived in this royal city of Susa uh, the winter residence of Artaxerxes, the Persian king, and due to the homeland of Nehemiah being a thousand miles away, he had a heart for that. So he was asking questions all the time. What's going on there? I mean, I, I want to know, is, is th are things going better? And he was cupbearer to the king, um, a man of great influence uh, and importance. He was like a prime minister, master of ceremonies, all rolled into one. So in his role, he said, God put me in this place at this time to do something extraordinary and I'm listening and I'm watching. And when he asked the question and Hananiah, his, his brother came and told him what he saw in Jerusalem, he could not help but be overcome with grief. And last week I mentioned just one of the traits that made him so influential and effective and that was that Nehemiah was a leader who was not afraid to hurt and feel the pain of others. He, he looked at the situation and said, Man, I, I am overwhelmed with sadness about what is happening here. Um, and that just drove him to his knees. It, it brought out of him something that maybe he had not expected at that point. When he felt the pain, what did he do with it? He said, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So he actively sought God out. Lord, I just gonna, I'm just going to pour out my heart. Um, and this was his greatest priority. This was the most important use of his time. This was his highest hope. He could not help but say, this is the situation I find myself in. And, and I want to, I just need to pour that out to you. He prayed. He really prayed. And then he waited to see what God would do with that prayer. 
Is that something that you do when you feel overwhelmed? Is, is your first place is, man, Lord, I, I just want to get in tune with you and, and pour out my heart to you about what's taking place. Most of us have learned to lift our concerns to God, right? Um, and then we say, okay, Lord, I'm going to share this concern with you. Um, it's in your hands now. Uh, I put it over there. You know um, what to do with this burden of yours just so I could cast it on you. Um, I'm going to just see how you answer that. That's up to you. Thanks for listening. And now I'll be on my way. Amen. And, and away we go. And, and parts of it, God wants us to leave the burden, but he wants us to stay in his presence. He wants us to, to be in that place where he, we're still in tune with him and, and what he's doing in the midst of that painful experience, keeping that connection open. And there are going to be moments in each of our lives um, where a situation sucks all the wind out of our sails. And in this particular one, Nehemiah was cut to the deepest part of his heart. It stuck with him. It penetrated deep inside. And he said, I just can't let go of this. The burden he felt was not lifted because there was something that he heard that he felt that, man, I feel like as I'm staying in this, that I'm supposed to do something with this. I have to respond to it. Have you ever been in one of those places where you just could tell that God is calling you into something and you have a deep burden about a situation that God has placed on your part, placed on your heart, and you, you actually can't get it out of your mind. I, I remember my call to Rochester, uh, Minnesota, 27 years ago. Um, I had come out of a very difficult process uh, of, of going through a conflict within a church and some real painful situations, and I went, man, I don't know if I ever want to do ministry again, but um, I found out that as I was going along and doing youth and family ministry that there was an opportunity um, at, uh, at a church here in Rye, Rochester Covenant Church, and uh, they invited me to come down. I got to meet the young people, and I said, wow, this looks like a, maybe, God, you're calling me here. And we've been praying about it and hearing about it, and it was like, okay, this, is, this seems like a really pretty good situation, but I, I don't know. There's something about this that I'm just, uh, my, my heart's burdened a, a bit by this, but I'm I don't know, God. I, I'm uncertain. So as I prayed, and then they said, would you come and serve here? And I remember saying, yeah, but uh, I haven't met the staff. And they go, oh, well, do you have to? And, uh, and I went, well, it's kind of important. I'm going to be working with them. I think it's pretty important that I meet and get some time with them. And what was amazing, well, right now, we're in the midst of huge difficulty and division within the staff, and we have not been able to um, overcome that. So would you come even though that's a, you know, a really tough situation? And I said, well, I gotta sit down with the staff. I gotta find out what's actually going on. And so um, I went to um, the staff and I said, hey, I'd like to meet with all of you. And all three of them were there. And I remember sitting in the room and, and there, and I'd been praying the whole time, Lord, what is it that you wanna do in the midst of this? And as I'm sitting praying and we're having conversations, I noticed that there was really the tension in the room was like, wow, you could cut this with a knife. I mean, I just, I said, wow, this is tense. And I remember that uh, one of them just sitting there like this with the arms crossed and just looking at me like, just, just dare you to ask whatever question was on my heart. And I went, man, I'm scared right now. And so um, I asked this key question. I said, can you tell me how do you work through conflict? How do you deal with conflict? And, and they all looked at one another, and there was just silence. And finally, the, the person who was looking across looked at me and said, we don't and we won't. And I'm thinking, wow. Um, and, and I said, well, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I can't come into the midst of this if you guys aren't willing to. I said, the, and again, this is where I was praying for wisdom. And, and, just, and, and God anointed me with the right words, I think, to say at that time. And it was like, well, unless you're willing to go through the process, I've just been through this Mennonite process of peacekeeping and how to re resolve conflicts. Would you all commit to doing that? Is that something you'd commit to? Because otherwise, you can just, I'm not even, I'm not using this as a manipulative piece, but I can't come if you're not willing to deal with the very issues because what's happening here is going to happen out in the congregation and it's already probably happening. And they were willing to do that. And I said, okay, well, I need to go back and pray some more. And I remember telling Mary, and we're both, we're both in tears. No, we, we don't want to go. 
Um, I, I don't want to enter into this painful situation. I, I don't want to go and, and be in another place where um, now we've got to, got to deal with stuff. And, and I remember just praying for days, uh, at times just pouring out my heart and saying, Lord, is this, is this where you want me? Is this a burden you want me to carry in your strength? I'm hoping you hear that part of this. I don't know where you're at, but there are burdens that God gives you. And he said they'll be light and easy to carry in his strength. But that makes it no less. There is a weight to whatever it is that God calls you into that maybe you haven't asked for this season. Maybe there are situations you find. Maybe there are people you're journeying with that are like, this is really difficult. I got to say that God says, I will sustain you, but you're going to be broken in the midst of this. This is going to be difficult. And, and again, as, as my first reaction was, I think I just what I think I'll just turn this down and look for some other place that would be easier to go to where there's not conflict. Um, but I appreciate um, the fact that even in the midst of praying, that God made it very clear to me and to Mary that I'm calling you. And your job is to respond and watch to see what I can do in the midst of that. Nehemiah's prayer gives us some insight on how to come to God when you're burdened with a concern. When you're saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to enter into this now, and I'm going to wait and watch and see what you do. Today, I want to use an acronym, PRAY, to help you remember the kind of prayer that truly changes a person because they put you in connection with the living God. And we're going to actually put this into practice today. This isn't just, hey, John, and I'll put this in. No, we're going to actually do this together today um, as we walk through this. So here's the first one. Jesus, God, the very essence of the creator of all life, wants your praise. He wants you to praise him for who he is. He wants you to recognize the power of the one you're talking to and give him thanks. He wants your praise and understanding that do you see who I am? The, the God of everything, the, the God who created the whole idea of love and compassion and kindness and goodness. Uh, I will bring fruit out of your life that's extraordinary. Do you realize who I am? And he wants to be praised. I mean, look at Nehemiah. Oh, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God. And he's not just doing platitudes here. He knows this. They, Israelites, are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and mighty hand. He knows what God has done. He sees it, and so he's, he's, he's articulating, I see this, I join you in what you are doing. Uh, th there was a point um, in my life where I wasn't doing a, a whole lot of praise of God. I wasn't thanking Him. I was more struggling. I think that must be my... Well, you guys know me well enough. It, it's like, that, that, that's, that's, my, that's who I am, right? It, it's like, I wish I could just... Be that kind of person, hey, I'm completely surrendered to God all the time, and I never have to battle that. But but for me, I, I seem to have to struggle along the way. And I remember there was a point of saying, I want to give you thanks, but I'm seeing all this this difficulty, and I and I and, and I'm just so help me to overcome myself with all the things that I'm battling against. And I remember that I took on driving bus for handicapped children. Um, I worked up in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis downtown, and I'd pick up these kids and um, they often would give me routes that really no one else wanted. Um, and I said, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and so I was picking up children who were in handicap, um, and these special wheelchairs, and I had a bus where I had to load them up and, and bring them in. And there was one particular young person that um, I would pick up. I only had a few to pick up on this particular route. Andy was his name. He was in a wheelchair. And there was a time I was gone for a couple of days, and I came back to pick him up, and, and Andy and I, we got along really well. I mean, we, it was fun to talk to this student. He was one of the last ones I dropped off um, at school. And I remember when I got back on the bus that morning, and I'm wheeling him in there, and I'm securing, and I would explain to him what I'm doing. Okay, this got this wheel secured, I got this wheel secured, this one, this one, all right. I'd move his chair and said, does that feel okay to you? And he goes, that feels great. And I remember this particular day, he said, I'm so glad you're back. I feel so much safer when you're driving. I said, well, is it okay? Yeah, the other guy didn't really, he wasn't that great. I was always concerned when we were driving around because that points of security is the only thing he had to hold on to. And in that moment, I felt 
God just break in and speak to me? Saying, you know what? That's what I want to hear from you, John. I want to hear from you that you feel safe and secure when I'm at the wheel. I want you to know that I've got things under control and that you can just hold on and I'll take care of things. I'm watching out for you. And that was such a powerful moment. It just stuck with me as I looked back there. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, Andy was this, this kid who wanted to feel real secure, but he was also the kid when we got off the bus and I started wheeling him around in his school. I remember one time I was wheeling him and he would always say, go faster, go faster. And so I'd you know, be cruising all over down the halls and I got reprimanded for that. You can't be doing that. That's dangerous. And so, and he would say, go faster. And so I talked to the, the principal and the person who was in charge of that. And I said, but you know, this is the only time he gets to, to go fast. And they go, well, I'll tell you what, go to the gym. And you can go around in there. And they let me do that. So in the mornings, he'd go, let's go. And we cruise around the gym in his wheelchair. And that was the only time that, that I heard him really laugh. And I realized the only reason he let me do that is because he feels safe. He's out of control, right? Only person controlling that is me. And that's a place where I think God wants to say, can you, can you see what I'm doing? Can you praise me for what I'm able to, to do? And I was so thankful that he did that, that God is watching over you. So we want to praise God for who he is, recognize the power of the one you're talking to, give him thanks. And I'm going to invite the worship team up. And, and we're going to do two things. We're, we're, going to, we're going to recite together our praise to God. And I want you to really focus on him, even as we say this and as we sing this next song together. So let's, let's do this. Let's uh, shout our praise to God. Shout joyful praises to God all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Your enemies cringe before your mighty power. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious song.
God and we're focused on Him, it displaces all those other worries and concerns and anxieties. It's something powerful that happens because all of a sudden we're in a place where now we are lifting up who He is and remembering all He is about. And I think that's where, as we look at the second part of Nehemiah, when he was doing that, um, I want you to know that it's important to then remember the promises he has made to us. And, and here's, what, here's what Nehemiah says. Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then, even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I'll gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. And, and here's the key. God wants us to remember his promises. And if you've got your hand out there, there's a couple of key things in there that are, that are absolutely crucial. He says he has redeemed you and he has forgiven you. He's delivered you from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There, there are so many promises, and I just wrote down a few for us to kind of remember here this morning. He says He gives strength to the weary. He'll give you rest when you feel like there's no rest to be found. He, has, he is the one who will never fail you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never give up on you. He's adopted you. He's going to fight for you. He'll give you wisdom as you ask. He's the one who will never betray you. He will always be there. He will stand by your side no matter what. And he's preparing a place right now to be with you forever. It's what he wants to do. He wants you to know this. And so as you reflect on that, it's like, oh, if God is for me, who can be against me kind of thing. If, if these are the promises I'm living and I'm remembering and I'm drawing to mind every single day, then all of a sudden... The things of this world grow strangely dim. The things that are, are overwhelming, it's like, wow, Lord, I, I'm going I'm to make sure I'm remembering those things before anything else. So that then leads us to the place, now I've got that in my mind, I'm going to pour out to you some of my concerns. I'm going to actually do this next step that you see. But before we do that, I, I want you to get in your mind this, and I want us to remember this. Because we're grafted in. He says, you are grafted into my plan that I've had um, for all eternity as the promised people. Um, and so here's what he says. And let's, let's speak this together in Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. So as we're pursuing him, as we're remembering his promises, as we're entering into that, there's something extraordinary that happens because now it's like, okay, Lord, I, I know who you are, and now I feel confident to bring these concerns before you because now I recognize you're the one who can carry them and deal with this and, and whatever you have planned like no one else. So now you see Nehemiah also asking God to hear his concerns, and that's what God asks of us. That's the A. Uh, um, ask God to hear your concerns, your, your, your struggles, whatever it might be, your anxiety, your fears, what, whatever that is. Nehemiah says, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. So he sees petitioning before God. I, I'm, I'm going to ask that you hear me, and I want to pour that out. So when we ask God to hear our concerns, it's whatever's on our heart and mind. Whatever's there saying, Lord, I'm just going to be honest, authentic, real with you. I'm going to really put this in your knowing who you are. So here, here's a prayer that I offer to give you, and let's say this together. Lord Jesus, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servants are praying before you. We come before you because we need you and want you to direct our lives. Hear our hearts and voices as we come seeking you and your plan for us. We can come before God and do just that. And, and, and also it's an expression of us doing that. And as the worship team comes forward again to, 
to do this next song, this is a chance for us to pour out our concerns before God. This is the concerns of this next song together as we come and he says, come to me, you who are weary, heavy laden. He says, uh, those who are anxious, I invite you to also come and cast your anxieties upon me because I care for you. He invites you to say, hey, come along with thanksgiving with any expression of heart and I will hear. And so let's sing this song as we call upon God to hear our prayers. recognize our need for God and we pour out. He asks us to do something that is sometimes very, very difficult. And that's this next piece of it. And that is to yield to God's conviction on your heart. It means now you enter into what God is going to do with whatever situation you find yourself in. And I know some of you are carrying really heavy burdens right now. I know there's a part saying, Lord, I, I want to know that I can depend upon you. I want to know in this situation that I can really 
trust you and find that I'm safe in that. And this is where he's asking us to take that step of faith and yield to the conviction on our hearts. And this is where also confession is part of agreeing with God's viewpoint. And it means that, Lord, I confess that I'm not who I need to be, but you want me to let go of that and release that in you and to recognize my inability to work up my own righteousness, my own power, and, and that of what needs to take place. And so I confess my need, but I also confess my inability to do the very things that you want to do, that you want me to do. But you already know that, and you know that I failed. And so here it is, Nehemiah saying, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. A piece of yielding means that I, I recognize my need for you. I remember, as I mentioned, the driving the bus, and, and I feel safe and secure you know, the Andy saying that, I remember every time I got in it and now put those buckles on his wheelchair wheels and asked him and shook it, is this good? Do you feel safe? Yeah. Off we go. Um, he would sometimes tell me, go faster in the bus, but, but I didn't do that. Um, but it was the idea of, you know, you feel now secure in this and you admitted to me that you aren't able to do this on your own. I think this is where a lot of times we get caught saying, oh, I'm never going to measure up what God wants. He knows that. He already knows you're going to fail him. He already knows what those are, and he says, please don't let that stop you from beginning the process of trusting me. Just release that, admit it, and then let's move forward with my plan for you. But first of all, you've got to yield that and be honest about where you've been at. Whatever that means, whatever's holding you back from that trusting God. So today, we're going to do this. We're going to yield to God. And so um, we're going to do this together as the worship team uh, will come forward after this. But let's, let's do this. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give you just a few moments um, to have this silent um, reflection. Lord, is there anything you want to speak to my heart? David did that. Lord, show me if there's any offensive way and lead me in there last week. But just, just take a moment to release whatever's maybe difficult for you to even trust him on. Or maybe he brings to mind something that you've done and, and, and he's kind of like, just let that into my hands. Let me bathe you with my forgiveness. So let's just take a couple moments to do that. Lord Jesus, you convict our hearts not to condemn us, but to free us. You sometimes show us the things that we have done wrong, where we've rebelled, where we've gone off in our own way, and you so want us to enter in and admit that we've made that mistake so that you could restore us and bring us closer to yourself. You also want us to admit where we don't have the strength and energy to do maybe the things that you've asked us to do, to enter in, to trust you, to follow you. And we want to confess that I believe, but help my unbelief. Help the places where I doubt. Lord Jesus, draw me close in this. And so as we do this, we yield to the conviction you place on our heart as we, your people, seek you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Now, Nehemiah didn't go to the king right away. 
He was praying for over four months. The news came that the people were discouraged and disgraced. The walls of Jerusalem were in piles of rubble. The Jerusalem calendar would have been November and December. Ironically, it's called the month of dreams. Nehemiah doesn't speak to the king about this until the month of Nisan, which is March or April. So many, many months he carried on with this, this petition before God. And he said, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm beckoning. I want to make sure I'm in tune with you. He continued to feel the burden of this prayer for over 120 days before he even acted on it. And here's the last part of that. When you spend time with God, he gives you clarity about the action he's inviting you to join him in. When you spend that kind of time, okay, God, I'm doing this. Nehemiah 1 says, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and the prayer of your servants, who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Is it hard to be patient in prayer and waiting? I mean, isn't that hard? Do you find that difficult? To go in the long season of just laying things out before God again and again, making sure we get clarity? I, I don't think we can really get to that place unless we've taken enough time that God really settles into us to know what that movement looks like. Our role is to keep coming before him as he puts that burden on our heart, as he, as he takes us into that place of waiting on him. When he finally goes to King Artaxerxes at what appears to be the lowest, most sad moment he had over the last few months, look what it says in Nehemiah 2. It says, The king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. Isn't that interesting? I was afraid. And I don't know where you're at, but if you have fear about whatever place God's asked you, boy, let him know. I'm afraid. But I'm going to take those steps of courage and faith and see what he does. And he says, But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins? Its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. Isn't it interesting, even at that moment? Just a moment, king. I can't imagine what this was like. Just a moment. I want one last clear moment to make sure this is what God wants. I feel it in all the things, but Lord, is this really what you want? And then I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. What a powerful thing to say. I want to join God in the burden that he's placed upon my heart. Was Nehemiah afraid of the response would be? I bet he was. It kind of shows that. It took some time to get clarity about what God was asking him. But it seemed like the Lord's leading. He kept pressing into it. And this is something we're going to discover over the coming week, weeks. Is how is God asking us to press in and trust Him, to join Him? I, we have been following God's leading for the last 14 years here at New Day. We felt um, the lead to plant this church um, at the YMCA. And when it closed at the beginning of this year, um, we've been through a time of rediscovery. We're in that right now. Um, there's some loss. There's a, there's a part of our identity we, we've struggled with. But God is at work in our midst. He's looking to see if we'll take the time to listen to him, to understand his leading. And we want to ask him together to, to do just that, to, to basically, God, we are asking you to guide us and lead us. We are looking to you so that we can continue to be your hands and feet in wherever you call us to do. And so let's, let's pray this prayer together as we do this. Let's pray. Circle us, Lord, in this time of discernment. Fill us with your knowledge and empty us of self-reliance. Increase our godly wisdom and decrease our human arrogance. Grow your fruit in us and prune away any spiritual decay. Strengthen your spirit's power within us and weaken our own striving. Deepen our endurance and patience and diminish our short-sightedness and need for quick fixes. Bring us into your kingdom of light and rescue us from the dominion of darkness. May you, our loving Father, Son, and Spirit, encircle us as we fix our eyes on you. Amen. So this last song um, may it be a prayer of thanks to God for his leading 
and watching over us no matter what we're going to encounter. We're here at this time in this place because God opened doors for us to be at Taco Jed. Um, he has placed us in individual places as well. And he's kind of watching, what are you going to do? Are you going to join me in what I want to do in the midst of that? There's one phrase that states, when the roar that I hear is the voice of my fear, trying to silence this hope in my heart, I will give thanks. Oh yes, I will give thanks. And it's giving thanks because we have the security. So uh, let's stand and sing this last song together uh, again and again. Yeah.
give our God a big hand. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that we can rejoice. The joy of having you in our life is our strength. You are our God. There is no one like you. And so as we go forth, may our eyes be so fixed on you that the things of this world do grow strangely dim, that, that this joy just bubbles over and the world around says, how can you see that that way? Because we have a God who sees far beyond whatever situation we're in. And he loves me with an everlasting love that will never stop. Lord, thank you for doing everything to draw us to yourself. So we honor you and praise you with ourselves the rest of this day. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I send you out with this. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Go forth with that. Amen. Thank you.